Hey there, Edition Warriors. In the battle to find the true face of D&D, &D, you have to leave pieces of yourself behind. And even little bits of the game. Tidbits. How do you feel about reaction tables for your NPCs? Tidbits. Tidbits. Do you find yourself missing, Thacko? Curious about converting to XP for gold? How strong do you feel about 18 double zero? Helpless to run a dungeon crawl without exploration turns? All right, Jim, let's have a bit of a discussion. Mm on the future, the present, the past, all of these things. Like, when it comes to these editions of D&D, &D, yeah, yeah. why do we look back? Like, oh, what, 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 what purpose is there? Well, yeah, that's a good question, because, you know, I, I think there's a, um, an attitude, a sort of mindset uh, in, the, in the RPG hobby that says new games are, are sort of built upon the, the, the old foundations, they represent progress, they represent mm -hmm. a, a, a movement towards a direction of a better game. Yeah. And more I kinda, perfect game. Sure, I, I kind of bought into this for a long time, uh, and and you know I saw say third edition as an improvement over second edition, and and really bought into it, right? Like unified you, mechanics. Unified all. mechanics. Oh, second edition was a mess. You know, I played it for like less than a year, um, and it played it in late era second yeah. edition, right? Like it, the, after Splat Bloat and and the Power Options books mm -hmm. had come out, all the kits and, came out. Yeah, oh, yeah. Be like comparing, you know, third and fourth. Uh, if you only played third in like the last year of its. <laughs> you know existence first game i played was with the book of nine swords <laughs> right yeah you just be like yeah i think there is a, a an attitude of you know game you know newer games represent uh you know a, a progression of development they that the mechanics are better that that it just everything is better and, and to treat rpgs almost like a type of technology in which the next generation supersedes the one before mm -hmm. it and i just think that's bullshit <laughs> you know, I just <laughs> how how can you see where the next edition is going uh, you with know, your with always looking over your shoulder? Well, you know? for one, the differences between the way the games are written and the games are played means that a lot of mythology gets built up around mm -hmm. older editions, especially of older editions of D and D, because D and D sits at sort of the pinnacle of the hobby. It's the entryway for a lot of people into RPGs. How people play D and D, had their first experiences with D and D, like for a lot of them, colors their experience with the, in RPGs. And so it's worth going back and looking because you might be, have a completely distorted understanding of what the play culture uh, was like back then, what the kind of rules were. So I take like take D&D. My thought of, of, of how the original game went was that it was soulless sort of uh, hack fest <laughs> where mm -hmm. Where it was like we might as well be playing a war game and a not very good one at that. Uh, it, you know, it's only after years and years and years of buildup of material that we kind of have a game that that we kind of like. Although honestly, as long as I've played D and D, I've known people who just gripe about it for whatever reason. So it's kind of hard to formulate an opinion about it uh, un, uh, untainted by the <laughs> you know those around you who. You know, you've never picked up a die in your life and they're trying to explain to you why it sucks. And I don't know, I, I feel like I want to revisit second edition at some point just to, to see how it plays. Uh, a true know. revisit? Yeah, a true I, revisit. I would, I would love that as well considering it's the edition where I came in. D &D. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I only played probably three, four characters tops. Yeah, um, but before, before third edition Before third edition out. came mm. out. I mean, yeah, I think there was Rockard, Alero, Peter of the North, and <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> He's a cleric. He liked to lay on hands. <laughs> yeah, I ran one campaign in it, uh, you know, before right before third edition came out, and so I, I think, like, to answer the question, why do we look back? Why would you go back? There, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Some of it relates to like obscure corners of the RPG uh, hobby. Especially, I'm thinking of uh, a place called the Forge, uh, which in the early 2000s was like a place for indie game developers and people to kind of like think and theorize about RPGs. It's where terms like gamist, simulationist, and narrativist were made more popular. They predate the Forge, but more popular there. And one of them was sort of this idea that D&D &D gave everybody brain damage because 
they thought they were telling stories, but they're not. And everybody who played D&D is over here, you know, uh, thinking they're doing one thing, but they're doing it very poorly. And, and it was like a general ridicule of people who played D&D, yeah. the culture and style of D&D. And then there were all these people who came on and were like, that's not it. That's not how it is at all. Well, I mean, <laughs> and, I, you know, like, yeah, I, I know, but I th- it sounds like really <laughs> like much like anything else, when you try to paint a group of people or whatever, yeah. any group with one brush stroke and yeah. make them a monolith, like you're just going to get it wrong. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> deep in the RPG hobby, I had the yeah, time yeah. to just spend a lot of time thinking and reading yeah. and, and, and writing about it. And it was out of that community that a, that a group sort of who were willing to look at original D&D and they were willing to investigate it and be like, is this exactly what we want? And it, and it was people who would go back and read it and then would describe how they played it and how they remembered playing it and then write up those experiences. And I was at a time when like third edition was just too much, just taking too much time to prep. I was looking for faster prep methods, faster play resolution. Mm-hmm. And I'm reading these things about a version of D&D that has fast prep, fast play resolution. Everything I want out of the game <laughs> is, is present <laughs> there. <laughs> and I was like, Maybe I should just try it. I did. Loved it. And it, to me, it is the, it's er d d It's pure. It's, it's, it's condensed. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, you know, I, I absolutely love uh, older versions of D&D, particularly any of them that were made before uh, um, the early 80s, because they have a type of energy and, and vitality to them that I find later editions lack. It appeals more to my aesthetic tastes. I don't like classic fantasy, knights in shining armor and princesses and towers and shit. I like swords and planets, sword and wizardry. Just, or, or no, sword and wizardry is a type of game, but... We <laughs> might mean, talk like, about that later. Sword and, sword and sandal, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the science sa- science fantasy is really present early on. And I just, I loved it. I found that I, you know, I ran Keep on the Borderlands using second edition and just like never even worried about converting it. I'd run against the Giants, played with a lot of old school modules because I just sort of found them at... at at used bookstores, and like that was the time, say, Necromancer Games was like third edition rules, first edition feel. So there was like a, a lot of talk about, and, and we're gonna go back and look, and Hackmaster was around, and people were talking for a while about how you could still play with the old rules through Hackmaster, you didn't have to use the new Wizards of the Coast things. And it was just a whole world of suggestion to just go back and look. Well, and yeah. I found just a treasure trove of, of great stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's go back and look. Let's meander through the editions uh, just to kind of give mm-hmm. some context, yeah. and then uh, and then maybe we can go and start picking a couple yeah. of those things that we just kind of kind of <laughs> miss, or like even if they were shit mechanics, it was just like I don't know. There, we'll get to that. We'll though. get to that. Yeah, we we talk a lot about it because there's a lot of topics around here and surrounding. I, I like I said, I do think it's BS that uh, the the idea that mechanic game mechanics necessarily must improve with each iteration as if it were you know as if it were some kind of immutable law mm-hmm. is is what I mostly object to so original d d three the three little brown books it's a mess <laughs> I actually like with the last few weeks I reread them because I was like had in my mind for a hot second I was gonna run a d d game using the chain mail rules from 71 and like wanted to try out you know the original game with the original combat. It's a mess. It's it's clearly uh, you know the work of of someone who's like just a passion for the hobby, but also writing for people who have a lot of the knowledge of how these games get played. And so there's not a lot of things that are explained very well. It's written in a kind of a stream of consciousness style. Mm-hmm. Uh, lots of sort of contradictions. What's going on? And for the people who love original D and D, piecing this together, tracking down Gary's notes, pouring over. You know, Q and A threads. It's like cracking a cipher. <laughs> it is, yeah. It's an adventure in and of itself. It's an adventure in and of itself. Tracking down Gary's house rules, which are you know start at third level and yeah. roll. You know, it's like nothing that you you know would necessarily have thought. Mm-hmm. Filling in those holes is a fun hobby for them. Well, so, yeah, I yeah. mean, it is. Is that not the beginning of meta gaming? It really kind of feels that way, and right. like filling in those uh, those holes. This is this is the early days of the hobby. There were uh, supplements released fairly early on for original D and D up through the uh, late 70s, but in 77, uh, they, they take the rules of, of original D&D and clean them up, put them in it, re, re-present them as uh, basic Dungeons and & Dragons. And I believe this is the Moldvay uh, version. Basic is usually split between two broad categories. There's BX, mm-hmm. which is Basic Expert, and then BECMI, Basic Expert, Companion, Master, Immortal. Eventually, in 1991, they released the Rules Compendium, which is all of the BECM rules. I don't think the I were included into one book, and it's like all you need, spells, monsters, how to run the game. If I was going to pick any one book 
of D&D to pick. It would be the rules compendium because it's everything you need one book. Yeah. I mean, forbid you do that now. <laughs> right. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, and have rules that are, you know, simple enough and, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, to present and, and still have not like a giant phone book size right, right. Uh, rule book. So as I understand it, TSR wanted like two parallel lines of Dungeons and Dragons because in 77, when there's the first basic D&D, that's also when AD&D, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, comes out. And that is the granddaddy, right? Like that's the one where you start getting the advice you get from the founders like Gygax. He'll say something like, you know, we're not going to do your imagining for you. We're just going to give you some tools. You do it yourself yeah. to here is the right and proper way you should be playing Dungeons <laughs> yeah. and Dragons. Well, <laughs> so, Jim, it's advanced. <laughs> I guess what? This is when TSR is blowing up. They're exploding. This is like the golden age of D&D. As cool as it is to see people playing D&D on stream and to be in the current moment that we're in, like no one's making color form things out of D&D. There's not like, call me when the Critical Role cartoon spawns multiple cartoons that we can watch, like network television and all kinds of things like that. When we have the D&D channel? Yes. Please let that happen. I wasn't in tune with D&D at this time. I was a kid, uh, but I had D&D action figures. <laughs> I snuck in every morning to watch the D&D cartoon <laughs> until we yeah. got caught and we got grounded. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mom. The first edition lasts up until 89 when there's a second edition of it. Everybody freaks out. They think it's going to be a whole new version of the game. It's not. It's yeah. kind of cleaned up. Some new stuff added. Yeah. Uh, a lot of things taken away. No more references to devils, demons, satanic stuff. Oh. The boobs leave. Gee, I wonder or why. Or start getting covered up. The repercussions of satanic panic and to me like second edition is a time in the role-playing game where there's like not a ton of emphasis placed on D&D it's where White Wolf starts to make a name for themselves and other systems because D&D is had like I was playing RPGs during this and my impression of D&D players was that they were just they they were not a particularly fun group of people to play with because they weren't playing a particularly fun game. You better start playing West End, Star Wars, or, or one of the White Wolf games or something. But I still wanted to see what was going on. It looked fun. Art looked awesome. Uh, I will say that about second edition. Art was pretty cool. The image of the guy on the horse with the sword up, and he's got the winged, the helmet. winged helmet. The, all that imagery was so evocative. Yeah, yeah. And it's sort of like, to me, it's like high fantasy, classic, just like firing on all cylinders D&D. And of course, like, there's splat books coming out all the time. This is when a lot of the great uh, setting books are coming out. Uh, I was in second edition. But by the time I was playing it, there's just a lot of stuff. <laughs> and And... I remember sitting down to make my first character and there were like five books that were out just to look up tables uh, and things like that. And it was like choosing a kit. And I got through it. I, I muddled through it, you know. Like, I guess I'm doing it right, you know. I'll figure it out eventually. But um, yeah, all your complete books. Yeah, complete right, fighters, all the complete books. Complete yeah. thieves. All great. Get them, satch no. them up, you can find them. I grab them anytime I'm at half price. Yeah. So then third edition comes out in, in uh, 2000. And the, this is when, you know, I'm, we're playing all the time. And, and for me, it was like uh, articles in Dragon Magazine where you're like, all right. Here's what's going to be new. Prestige classes, feats, all different kinds of multi-classing, getting rid of level limits for whatever. Anyone can be any class. Uh, it seemed just like, oh my God, this was amazing. This was great. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we played the hell out of it. Yeah, taking uh, the training uh, wheels loved off. Loved it, and, taking yeah. the training wheels off. A unified mechanic, you know. Uh -huh. uh, to me, I saw it as a breath of, breath of fresh air. And then like 2003, it's 3.5. And I just was like, this seems weird. That's okay. And then like 2008, it's fourth edition. And once we get into third edition and, and sort of like the, the idea that they could codify everything that needed to be in the game, that you could almost remove, and this is hyperbolic, but you almost remove the GM from, from play. That you didn't quite need them. And I just remember sort of feeling that generally when I was DMing at the time, being online and talking to people. It seemed like it was very player focused, but not like, Player focused in a way to make the game better, mm -hmm. but player focused in a way to be very indulgent uh, is how it seems to me. Well, I mean, you know, Jim, I used to spend a lot of time on my characters. Yes. And the thing is, is you kind of had to. It sure. Was, uh, it was a lot easier to make a crappy character in third edition if you did not pay attention to what you're supposed to do. True. Sure. Well, what you're supposed to do. And the game assumed that you were going to do something, right? Like yeah. if you did not spend your money on magic items and upgrading your magic items or your DM wasn't like handing them out uh, at regular intervals, then the game kind of assumed that that would be happening. And if you didn't, you'd sort of start to fall behind in terms of your effectiveness. And it just, it, to me, it, it kick-started and, and supercharged the, the kind of culture of optimization, of mm -hmm. builds, of things like that. I have no idea because I wasn't plugged into the D&D world before then if, if it existed in second edition, um, despite the terror of the dart thrower uh, <laughs> that was uh, second edition. <laughs> the, I, it just seemed like that the emphasis was placed on mechanical mastery and, and, and a kind of white room theory crafting 
that that seemed to dominate the kind of the hobby during the time. And I look back on third edition, uh, you know, both parts of it, uh, and you know, there's a lot of cool stuff there. There's a lot of great just books to read and flip through. And mm -hmm. because third and fifth are so close, and the the amount of conversion work needed to to uh, make it work is minimal. It really it's is. It's really like a whole other <laughs> resource of books and things for your game. And there's a lot of really cool ones. Um, yeah, you pretty much just cut the numbers in half of third, and you, that's what you get for fifth. Why, and then there's also Pathfinder, which just has a whole host of books and options and just things to read and inspire you and bring over to the other game. So yeah. you're starting to get into those versions of D&D &D that maybe more people have played, more more people have experience with. Fourth edition, I don't, I don't like to badmouth it as much as I, I did when it was around because, but first off, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares. <laughs> but also, it's not my game. That doesn't make it a bad game. Yeah. Uh, and, and it, but yet, I still find a lot of stuff there uh, uh, that I want to bring into my D&D &D and, yeah. and I, I wish wasn't Gotten rid of or well, stick around. You there, know? Were, there was a lot of stuff that was streamlined, and I get I get what they were doing. And longtime viewers of the show know what I'm going to say, but it was sure. an overcorrection. And sure, yeah. It became too much of a video game. Yeah, and, and I think like looking at that, looking at seeing like say 13th Age is is sort of the uh, what I would see as the continuation of the fourth edition you know ideas and, and project, and a lot of that by rights, I haven't played it yet, but just sort of looking at it, it's like it it addresses some of that and adds new things uh, that I think are. are kind of worth looking at mm -hmm. although I don't see it in the same category as like Pathfinder maybe that's just my ignorance that I don't like like consider Pathfinder like yeah it's not D&D because &D it's not the brand but that's D&D &D. I see all these games in the different versions of them like you know like you were talking about earlier that you know one shouldn't supersede the other or be better than the other but it, yeah it's not like shouldn't be thought of as like technology or anything like that i mean to me like role-playing games are expressions of of oneself they're more like languages sure like yeah. learning an rpg is like learning a language and sure. when you get to the next one you can see where it like you Connects. get more verbs and conjugations yeah, yeah and then eventually you have a a split a language that's parallel and that's sure. pathfinder you know yeah, yeah. and so that's why it's like you, know, you can learn a language but it doesn't make it any better it's just, it's just a different, different thing it's just a different thing yeah and, I, and at this point you know specifically with pathfinder it's interesting to see because they're now moving on and doing developing it in their own way and in, in a lot of ways the fact that you can kind of see a parallel development of third edition through pathfinder is the reason why people go back to original D&D &D, mm -hmm. is because they look and they go wait original D&D &D used a 2d6 system to resolve combat all kinds of things and this alternate method of rolling a d20 was introduced for people that didn't have chainmail. Yeah. And like, what if we didn't do that? How does the game play if it plays using chainmail? Are some things different? Does it play any different? Is there is this a missed opportunity? And that this whole D20 whatever with eventually the attack matrices and, and Thaco and all that, Oh, yeah. What if we just stuck with the 2d6? It's got the combined armor to hit. You know, it factors in the weapon versus the armor already. It's a thing. I don't know. I, that's hence why I was thinking about uh, running a short game of it, just to see mm -hmm. how it plays. But it, it's moments like that. It's realizing, like, wait a minute. There were decisions made all along the way, different ways this could have gone, different ways that you can interpret these rules or take them. And they did, which is why there are other role-playing games. Yeah, yeah. To go back and look and say, I love this. I love this aspect of it. Why did that disappear? Why did that mechanic go away? Mm -hmm. Why did the interpretation of something change? And seeing if you can take it and put it into the kind of D&D &D that you can find players for. You know. Exactly. <laughs> Honestly, that's what it is. <laughs> exactly. So let's start doing a little bit sure. of that, Jim. You've already talked about this 2D6 mechanic. I have, yeah. yeah. And I've mentioned it before. Uh, the 2D6 mechanic is one of uh, three mechanical resolution systems that are at, that pre-Wizards uh, of the Coast D&D had in common. There is the D20 roll. Sometimes you roll high, sometimes you roll low. Uh, there is a D percentile roll, which is sometimes just the d20 roll in disguise or vice versa and then there are uh, a variety of roles you make with d6s one of them is a 1d6 roll um, usually if it comes up one or two you've succeeded this would be like surprise is it d6 come up one or two all right you're good the 2d6 though because it produces a, a curve as interesting because it's used for reaction rolls mm -hmm. uh, although when you roll them and how often you roll them and whether you should roll them first before just doing what the monster normally does is 
changes depending on the version of the game. But it's basically low rolls, they're more likely to attack. So two through five is usually where you get the aggressive sort of thing. Six through 10 or six through nine is more, um, you know, you, you have uh, neutral uh, kind of uh, responses. And then maybe 10 and 12 are friendly, or 10, 11, 12 are friendly. Or you may even break it down further than that. But the idea is that uh, every monster has sort of a modifier that they can use to see how they would react to the, the party, or at least some versions of it do. Um, use a similar kind of thing with uh, morale, in mm -hmm. which you're wanting to like roll underneath their morale to, uh, which is usually expressed as a, a score that'll be between uh, that you roll two d six against. What I've found is that you could extrapolate that reaction roll of, of good neutral or, or bad neutral good, and apply it to pretty much anything. Now, guess what, Jim? You invented Power by the Apocalypse games. Well, no, I didn't. It's just they. That's all it is. <laughs> it's the 2d6 mechanic that ha that produces those ranges. And so I roll it for how does my uh, how does my NPC react to a party's proposal? Any it doesn't matter the proposal or the NPC or whatever. It's that's the, that's the role. How does the monster react when the the party presents an opportunity to trade or talk uh, instead of fight? That's that role. Oh, uh, my henchman, uh, I want you to go down that hole over there that we don't know what's at the bottom of and tell me what's coming back. Uh, I don't have any armor or gear. Gonna roll that two d six and no, sir, I am not doing that. It's like this is the role that you use to prevent players from just walking all over the setting. It's the role that you use to determine whether or not their interactions with other elements of the game succeed, assuming common sense and your own discretion don't provide a better answer for you. And like, once I found it, it was just sort of like, well, first off, I don't care that it's not the same as a D20, it's not unified, but that 2D6 role, whether it's reaction, morale, um, loyalty, uh, is, um, is one I use all the time. I prefer it to players rolling persuasion rolls. Uh, I, I would rather the player just, in 5th edition specifically, I would rather the player just tell me what their character says in however way they want to present it, and then I'll roll a die to see how my, my NPC reacts. Mm -hmm. And I like that better than having a die roll for the player because it gives, or for the character, because it gives the player the freedom to just say whatever they want. They don't feel like they gave an eloquent speech and then the, the, the dice just fell flat on their face. And it's like, well... I don't ever want to have to say, oh, we're going to ignore that thing I told you to roll because the way you did it was better. I'm just going to be like, we're not going to roll because I've, I've got a different tool for mm -hmm. that. My, it's my reaction that I'm looking for, my NPC's reaction. But I also use it with random encounters to vary things up a bit. Uh, it's probably the most important one that I use from old school D&D is that 2D6. Uh, 2d6 uh, roll resolution mechanic. Yeah, you have the reaction roll. You also mentioned like uh, exploration. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mechanic. I got to thinking about this one a few months back, and it's been on my mind for a while. We got a request uh, that I at first I was like, this is kind of odd. But the more and more I thought about it, the more I, I started like looking into it. And it, the request was, how do I run a dungeon crawl? Like I know the the person was like, I know how to uh, you, know, res you know resolve combat. I know how to you know, how the players, uh, you know, things work, but it's like, how do I tell where they are on the map? How do I tell where, where my traps are and if they've triggered them? How do I know X? How do I do, how do I do this? And I was just sort of like, well, you just kind of do it. Like they move however much their movement rate says, you track it with the map, they've got a marching order. And what I realized was that like, that is a process and a procedure that is no longer described uh, in D&D. And uh, Justin Alexander of the Alexandrian uh, blog recently wrote about this game structures and sort of like outlined the dungeon crawling procedure that you can find in original D&D. And it is a, it's what they call in game design a feedback loop where you're sort of doing the same thing. Combat is a, is a good feedback loop. I tell you what I do, I roll some dice. Uh, the DM narrates the outcome, and now you have new information. I tell you, you tell me what you're going to do. We roll some dice. Here's the new information, yeah. and it's boom, 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 boom. And that's the act of play. It drives things forward. In a dungeon crawl, without that, dungeon crawls without this procedure just feel like a random wandering between scene to scene. Yeah. And they don't necessarily feel like you're actually in a place moving through it. So the exploration mechanic uh, is. In the same way that combat is divided up into six, uh, six second turns, exploring a dungeon is divided up into 10 minute exploration turns. And that means that uh, for every 10 minutes, the DM rolls a, um, a variety of ways to determine if something happens. 
Sometimes it's just a single D6 roll, and if it comes up one or two, there's a random encounter. Uh, other times, uh, people use what's called a loaded encounter die, where you just roll a D6, and depending on what you roll, that's what will happen. One or a two might be an encounter. Three might be an environmental effect. Four yeah. might be check to see if the torches go out. Five might be uh, look to see if your food's spoiled, or if you, you know, and six could be something else entirely. And the idea there is that something's always happening. And that die roll, breaking everything up into 10 minute chunks means that the DM's constantly like, all right, tell me what you're doing for the next 10 minutes. Are you just walking down the corridor? Then we assume you're checking for traps and looking for secret doors. DM's gonna roll those randomly using a D6. Um, even if you walk over a trap, you do not automatically trigger it. <laughs> You've got a D6 roll to see if you trigger it, then you make your save. That's what things like marching order is for. That's what all of these things are. And you look at your map and count the squares, and then you describe that. There is a person, a player, who has to take your information and draw a map out of it. Reverse engineer. And reverse engineer the map. And it will not be the same. That is okay. It doesn't need to be. It's that. It's a procedure. It turns moving through the dungeon into a thing that's like combat. Mm -hmm. So that you know every time the DM says, okay, what do you guys do? That 10 minutes have passed. And every five turns, you gotta spend a turn resting. You yeah. know, they, that's another sort of thing. So it paces you through the dungeon, keeps you going. You know, torches last two hours. So you know, you, you, know, you know how to track it. And most DMs would have like a, either tick meter or like little clocks or countdown clocks or something on a sheet of paper so that they can keep track of that. And now think about having this tool, having a set of procedures that you walk through, like seven steps, some of them involving the player, some of them not. And it gives you a structure. You now know what's happening. Now you can start tracking monsters on the map. Now you can start tracking where your big NPCs are. Now you can start tracking all kinds of things because you've given yourself this uh, structure for play. Same thing with hex crawls. Hex crawl is one of those where you'll see a lot of different procedures for it, but there, are, there is a procedure. We are going to determine what the PCs do for the next four hours. Do you walk further along towards your goal? Do you explore the region that you're in? Do you try to forage? Do you try to hunt? Whatever you do, it's going to take four hours. We'll resolve it, and then we're going to go move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And you do that, you do that for every hex, and there's a map out in front of you. It's like, all right, here's my rolls for this one, and my rolls for this one, and the DM's rolling. And at some point, someone will say, stop, and say, okay, wait, you guys have found something. And it turns a journey, first off, into something that goes by like that. You know, you can play through a two or three week journey in no time at all, mm -hmm. using this, you just keep working through the procedure. And uh, of course, in uh, original and basic DD combat, it's very quick over uh, swiftly, but those are my two, the big ones. Like running a mega dungeon without an exploration turn seems just crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. why draw all that out? Just draw a flowchart or a bubble map or something. Like, yeah, that, you know, yeah. <laughs> you can abstract distances between the yeah. locations. Yeah, but, you if know. you're not actually going to track the progress of the PCs through those corridors, then find another way because you're using tools for one way of running a dungeon to play a different way. Yeah. You, know, you see what I'm saying? So um, Mega Dungeon opens up that possibility. The whole of sandbox play is, is supported by the rules, and that's where things like rumor tables and, and the like uh, find their way into D&D, &D, and then people stop running or preparing sandbox games, but they still include rumor tables, and so a lot of people think, like, this is stupid. Why are we, do we have this? We're just going to ignore these things. Um, but it wasn't always the case. That's how you found out what's out in that sandbox. What can I go f have, have fun with? Really, the, the last thing to say about original and basic is that gold, offering XP for gold, was the way <laughs> that the game dealt with murder hobos. And monsters were worth some XP, not wandering monsters, but wa monsters that you like found in their lair. And everything else you got because you hauled out pounds and pounds and pounds of treasure. You know, I used to hear in RPG circles like what you offer XP for and how you structure XP is like going to determine you know, the incentives of play. And I just was like, hey, you guys don't know anything about that. And it was watching this and then later on Invisible Sun that taught me, that was just like, oh yeah, whatever you offer XP for, that is what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And especially with old school play, the default is that we go into the dungeon, we get loot, we come out, and when we're out, we do whatever we want. We go party, we go spend it however we want. We get involved in tons of shenanigans. Like, mm -hmm. it looks like D&D. &D. You're messing around with NPCs, you're, you're, <laughs> you know, you're, you're yeah. playing D&D. &D. It's just 
a different emphasis in the rules. Yeah, you're passing out in your beer, punching camels. Uh, yeah, it's it's the old Conan. I mean, it's right? The, it's There's the a, old Conan. Yeah. It's the reason why he's broke his shit at the end, at the beginning of every adventure. Exactly. And he has to go adventure. <laughs> he right? has to go adventure. Yeah, and and like this style of play is very fun, very satisfying. I, I know that it's connected to the OSR. The OSR is a brand. The OSR is a, a, a movement and a brand and, and represents all kinds of things. It's very diverse, very big, but the games that spurred it and came out of it are not necessarily attached to that culture. Uh, and so you can enjoy a retro clone, you can enjoy uh, older versions of D&D. &D. Uh, a lot of these games have free versions, like Labyrinth Lord mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a retro clone of basic D&D, &D, uh, yeah. and um, Sword and Wizardry is a retro clone of, of original D&D. &D. Yeah. And they're really fun. And yeah, played it last night. Yeah, we played it last night. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I was going to say, one of the things I, I, that, <laughs> that I was going to throw in here is I love the roll under mechanic. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, the roll under. Yeah. Any, well, anything that is kind of the same, but just the opposite yeah. of what you normally do, it, there's something that's... I don't know what it is. It's just fresh. It just, it's a fresh thing. Yes. Right? Yeah, You're not I, doing yeah. the exact same thing yeah. every time. I'm going to roll this and yeah. add this. I'm going to roll yeah. it. No, no, no. no. I want to roll under this. Yes. I want to get a one. I want to get a one. Yeah. You know, it's a, yeah. I, a one shouldn't always be a bad thing. I, I definitely agree. And, you know, I was one of the many people who, when 3rd edition came out and the unified D20 mechanic was introduced, everybody's like, oh my God, this changes everything. It's awesome. Well, that's also because I hadn't really played 2nd edition long enough to really absorb the different ways that the die is rolled. And now that I, I have, and I kind of look back on it, I go, man, I really just love having different resolution mechanics. And I like it because it's like, I'm my character's performing different tasks. Yeah, it should be different, Th right? Th this helps to reinforce that feel. Mm -hmm. It's, th the probabilities are different. You know, sometimes we're rolling two dice, sometimes just one. The, the denomination of dice changes, which numbers you want on it, high or low. It's constantly changing. There's a reason behind it, it's not random. And it makes a certain type of sense once you see the pattern. But if you're just the kind of person who just wants everything to be the same mm -hmm. or, or, or doesn't understand why saves don't work like Thaco uh, yeah. and why I'm rolling a D6 sometimes instead of a D20, then you might come to the conclusion that it needs to be unified. But no, I, I, it's very satisfying, multiple resolution mechanics. Keeps your brain engaged. Exactly. You know? Although, Jim, um, I, I don't know about the statement that rolling these <laughs> dice isn't random because the act of rolling dice oh, yeah, is random. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I it, was just, it was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I can't help, you know me, I can't help but a little word play. Um, so, yeah, okay, well, let's... All right, let's, so that's, you, that's enough with me gushing about basic and original. Yeah, so I love it, personally. Let's, let's get into dumb. our inaugural game, which is second edition, and there's... There's some maligned... We're going to uh, skip first. Oh, sorry, my bad. Yes, of course. Proof first skip first. I'm just going to skip first. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I always conflate original oh, and first. Oh, sure, right. And, and, and listen, a lot of these games, and particularly TSR era games, are completely interchangeable. Yeah. You can you can have a second edition book that you're running a first edition adventure with. You can use basic rules for this. And guess what? You can also do the same with fifth edition. Yeah. Like, you don't need to do that much conversion work um, because it's robust and, and, and lighter uh, in, uh, in a way. But, um, yeah, first edition, I, I kind of lump it with these, but it is distinctly different. And, yeah. and both in terms of the its goals in play, you know, this is, this is where D&D is starting to become really popular. Their tournaments uh, conventions are becoming a thing. And it's a attempt to codify these rules and to me I don't look at a lot of rule stuff from first edition mostly because I like its expression in basic better um, but things I do like about uh, both editions of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons are like the, just the sheer number of spells the way the spells work the way the spells are worded uh, we talked about imprisonment uh, you know on one of our shows recently and it's like just the fact that it's like I cast the, the freedom version of this and other people might get free <laughs> you know, um, I love the first edition DMG. It's filled with terrible advice, but it's filled with awesome advice as well. Yeah. It's just fun to read and, and, and sparks my imagination. Um, those are the kinds of things I like about Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, yeah. The Splat books, Dungeon Survival, Dungeoneer Survival Guide, or the Wilderness Survival Guide, the Fiend Folio, or even like the power options from so called 2.5. You know, where they're like, here's how you break up all the racial abilities and create your own using a point by system to create it and, and balance it out. Or like, here's the, uh, here's like the first iteration of attacks of opportunity or five foot steps or things like that is in second edition. Mm -hmm. And so like, you can go, go back and read those and, uh, and hang out or not hang out, but just like try them out. If, uh, you like. The big one though, for advanced Dungeons and Dragons has got to be the adventures. Yeah. That there are so many adventures that come out during this period that are just. I iconic 
you know, and most of them are like before 85 uh, when Gary left TSR. But there's ones that come after that that are, that are good as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into each of them, but I'll just give you guys a rundown of some of my personal faves. Either these are ones I've read, played, or uh, either know by reputation. These are past editions. Uh, adventures, not just uh, advanced. But uh, Red Hand of Doom, which was a third edition adventure um, that's really cool. I always wanted to combine it with uh, Rise of Tiamat, but never did. Mm. Uh, Night Below is a second edition adventure, which is sort of like a night going into the Underdark, dealing with like the Underdark um, you know, denizens, civilizations, and the like. Uh, the Lost Caverns of uh, Jokanth, uh, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce that, is one of my, you know, set in Greyhawk. It's, it's the, you know, introduces um, the Demonomicon. Mm. Uh, it's it's uh, pretty fun. Um, the Lost City uh, is another one, which I believe that's the one where you're sort of like in the, uh, it's like in a buried pyramid. There's lots of faction play. And you sort of like can tell how a, a dungeon is supposed to be a social environment as well as a combat environment that I uh, really liked. Isle of Dread, Tomb of Wars, Keep on the Borderlands, Temple of Elemental Evil, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, Gates of Firestorm Peak. Now this is written by Bruce uh, R. Cordell and it's the first uh, iteration of Far Realm. Oh. And so this is, this is an adventure that came out after the 2.5 Power Options books and it's like got all the options, you can play with all of those, but it's also mm -hmm. just like at the heart of it, it's about the opening of a portal to the Far Realm and the terrible things that, <laughs> that happen because of that. And some others are like uh, Against the Cult of the Reptile God or the Forgotten Temple of uh, Therizadun. Um, the Caverns of Thracia is a Judges Guild product for uh, early versions of D&D, but it's absolutely just phenomenal. The other one, I guess, uh, sort of rounding things out is some of the Planescape adventures are high concept, really fun, like Dead Gods is mm -hmm. about resurrecting dead gods. So Infinite Staircase is fun. The Infinite Staircase is really fun. You know, so adventure Settings is another big one, right? Like Star or Spelljammer, al Qadim, Planescape, all those things are there, and these come out of this era of of D and D, and and while I think like the splat book bloat probably contributed to uh, you know maybe the misfortunes of TSR, but um, it's still fun. We still benefit from all of that and, mm -hmm. and have it be available to us and, and sort of like dive into it. Um, not so much for game mechanics, but just for inspiration. Yeah. It, yeah. What, what do you recall of the second edition? Well, like? I mean, it's, it's second edition. Uh, uh, I know I'm going to get some hate for this, but uh, I love Thaco. Okay. What is okay? So, what is it about Thaco that you like? Thaco. Maybe it was just because I was the guy at the table that was good at math, <laughs> yeah. and it gave me a sense of just like I get to. I and I was this. also like in my in the group of friends, I was kind of called the fearless leader. Sure, and yeah, yeah. it was just like once it came to D and D, I just I adopted that role naturally. My right. like my first character was just mm -hmm. kind of the leader of the group, and yeah. everybody went along with it and whatever. But just like being able to help people with it, and just the fact that it's like it's a weird mechanic that I did the opposite of what it said. Which yeah, later so turns out to be like the <laughs> alternate way of doing it. Yeah, there's um, several ways to calculate. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I always did the opposite. <laughs> if it was a negative armor class, I would add that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, to what I needed because it was a it was a thing of play in my mind. It was a it was a tiny little riddle that you had to solve every time you got into combat. Right. And and so and the thing is is once you knew the armor class and you solved the riddle. There's no more work to be done. Sure, right? sure, like sure. I, yeah. Like I know what I need. It was a way of unlocking the weakness of that monster in mm. a tiny, tiny little like word problem or sure. a little number problem. Sure, you know no, what I mean? little number problem. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It's just I, I just, I just love. The, the, sure. Yeah, There's yeah. something about just the phrase Thacko. Oh, for that, one, it's a uh, great, it's a great phrase. It, you know, the hate that it's gotten over the years, I think, is undeserved. Uh, it's also like there. It's not as if there weren't charts in the book you could copy down this information from. Yeah, I mean, they with literally space had a, on your character sheet, sheet to put it. Where you yeah. just wrote the number. It was, right. It was literally right there. Yeah. So um, the people who are like, it's hard to calculate or hard to do. It's like. Where you're not using that tool, and I think it's just something people like to complain about. It's weird, yeah. right? The the armor class descends; it doesn't ascend. Armor class zero, which is what Thaco to hit armor class zero, mm -hmm. what it stands for, is it seems counterintuitive. Why is lower better? But also, I can't just roll like this. Is one of those where I do think switching to ascending armor class and having a, a you know a base attack bonus that increases is a is one of the innovations of third edition. Mm -hmm. That said, Thacko is hardly uh, the devil mm -hmm. and, and malignant game mechanic that yeah. it often gets uh, uh, characterized as. Yeah, but another uh, another thing I loved uh, about Second Edition was that uh, man, when you're rolling up it, that new character, yeah, and you're like, all right, this is going to be a great character, and that first thing you roll is an eight, and you're just like, <laughs> especially if you roll with a DM that was like rolling order, yeah, 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 still, yeah, yeah. and I'm just like, oh my god, oh my god, I got to be a fighting, I get to be man. a fighter. <laughs> 
give me my percentile dice. Everybody gather around, and it became like yeah, almost you had like to watch. The, everybody got around. And it almost yeah. became like a ritual. Everybody's sure. like doing their little thing, and you're just like, yeah. and you and you roll that percentile dice that could vastly like alter how powerful your character really oh, was. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I got I got my first character had an 18 strength. I think I rolled 1846. Mm. Yeah. Which, you know, it, it, really it's like you want to get 52 or above for like, you know, <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. Play, look at the up. look it up yourself and you'll yeah. see why. Yeah. To hit and damage bonuses from strength were not the same. So you'd get like, yeah. you generally your damage bonus would be higher than your hit bonus yeah. from it. And so you're talking like 18 double zero. That's a plus three, plus six. Yeah. You know, plus, plus three th- to hit, plus three, plus six when, uh, what, 18 is... Plus one, plus three. Two. Plus, plus, one, one, plus one, plus two. two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, if I so, recall, yeah. Yeah, the bonus there is nuts. nuts and when yeah. you think about the difference between just 18 and 18 double zero yeah. versus, like, say, 5th edition, where a character can regularly, if, if you're rolling, yeah. you could get up to 20 pretty quickly. You could, yeah. If but you're, even you're rolling, that, we're lucky. the only difference between an 18 and a 20 is plus, plus one. one. I liked the double zero. I think I had one character that ended up with him but I, I use I, oh no it was the Collins of Overpower that wow, he got yeah, getting that straight <laughs> that'll get that'll get you the double eight yeah, double <laughs> the eight, eight, zero. Zero, yeah, yeah. I liked it because it signified first off the fact that only one class got access to it the fact that it was uh, you know that it broke the sort of standard pattern and created this uh, this expanded range of, of, of scores mm-hmm. I it just it seemed um, it just felt like it added something uh, substantial to the game. It felt like it further differentiated some of these fighters, and it um, it added a granularity that I liked. But yeah. I, I get what you're saying, though. The, there's but, not enough variation. Between and it, the, and the it gave them the bonus that you needed to live and be uh, useful in a world where you had clerics calling down miracles from their god. Oh, sure, yeah. And, I mean, we're talking second edition where people are invisible, flying, with shields up, oh, yeah, and protection yeah, yeah. Yeah, from this elements. Is, this is the, no, yeah, there's no concentration. Defenses, just, uh-huh. like, seven, eight defenses stacked on top of one another. And it's like, why aren't you playing a wizard? And it's like... Well, yeah. you see the sword. Yeah, I could cut you in half with it. I could cut you in half. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you still had, and that was back when fighters still had really good, you know, decent saves and yeah, and that, mm-hmm. yeah. And and so this is another thing that I that you know when you're talking about going back and looking at the other editions is like you can see how you know there are some classes who get like maligned and like oh nobody plays this or this is a broken class or stupid and you kind of see like well what is it about fighters that they stick around for so long and it's like well in original and basic they're tough as nails the only one you can use all these weapons Mm -hmm. like they're better fighters than than the ones you'd be able to hire and and Mm -hmm. they're kind of like an everyman type character when that gets broken up when when classes start being more about like the powers that they can bring to bear and like the awesome stuff that they can do and you just have a guy who fights well then that's gonna you're gonna start um you know, falling behind. Another thing of that, and I'll mention it here real quick, what I liked were the class-specific XP tables. Yep. And so with 3rd edition, they, they introduced a unified XP table. Everybody's on the same track. We, you know, we all get the same amounts, and we all, you know, apply that to the same uh, totals. Whereas uh, in editions before that, every class had advanced through their levels at a variable rate. And with second edition, they also got specific XP for engaging in specific activities. Yeah. And so while I never played with those rules, I, they always fascinated me because to me they suggested like that you, you know wizards studying and researching magic, which is usually not an adventure worthy activity. Like maybe there's a way to make that an adventure. Maybe there's a way to do that because they're getting XP for it. You know. Right. Right. Um, right. Well, I mean, like you're talking about, you know, uh, incentivizing players. To do you know what their character would do and not just go out and murder everything. If you want to incentivize them, providing like class specific XP incentives was a great way to do that. And then with the fact that, the, or at least I think a clever way to do that. I don't mm-hmm. know if it was great or not. The other one was like you know the, the different advancement tables meant that you weren't so much like balancing your characters on a level basis. It was that every one of a certain XP total would generally be mm-hmm. balanced. And so it meant it took the long time for magic users to finally start getting their spells, but the higher level they got, the easier, you know, their the the curve of their table changed. Whereas for others, they had different, their, you know, here's this part where it gets harder or less uh, so. If you're a thief, you're basically a sprinter on that XP Oh God, yeah, you'd be four level or five th- levels yeah. ab- above the party, but you know, you're also a thief. Like, you didn't have much. <laughs> and listen, thieves, strong archetype, not, I, it took the rogue. It, it took, and it took to me. It took several iterations of the rogue to get like a skill-based character that feels right. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Thief wasn't it for me personally. You ready to move on to third edition? Yeah, let's the, talk. Let's the, yeah, the let's put Beast here. itself. Yeah, I'll, I will say this: going through that vast skill system as a as a rogue. Yeah, and figuring out all the synergy the bonuses. Synergies, yeah, everything. And you can like do. like that little mini game. Yeah. to be the best at the at, at the jack of all trades skills that yeah. you could be. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I really like that. Like, I, I do kind of miss that, <laughs> even though that is part part of the problem. Why, like, I, yeah, I mean, it contributes to bloat and just like yeah. take, and especially for me, it was like the the uh, amount of time it would take to create a character. Oh yeah. Like, and, and as the additions have grown and gotten more and more complex, uh, and like, it, the longer it takes to create a character, mm -hmm. you literally can make one original D and D in less than five minutes. It's, yep. You know, it takes no time at all, uh, and and that means that if a character dies, which they more than likely will, you can be back in the game. No time, you know. And, Five and, minutes later. Yeah, and and there's uh, there are sort of like rules and and traditions and sort of play, play styles that remove the barriers for getting people to the adventure and adventuring together. I forget exactly what we're talking about, but third edition. Third edition. Yes. Uh, I, uh, tidbits. 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 Uh, <laughs> I like the rules. I like the ambition of third edition. Mm -hmm. The ambition of we are going to codify and have a rule for any potential scenario or situation or thing that might come up is just audacious mm -hmm. it just feels ballsy yeah because i'm just kind of like well, do we need that well, we, <laughs> have <know>? <laughs> we have a rule for it <laughs> i don't know i can't speak to uh, you know what was going on or what was the um <laughs> the, the kind of motivations uh, play with that but mm -hmm. it felt like at the time that what they're trying to do is like limit the influence of the GM. Mm -hmm. That a lot of online discourse at that time was was focused on bad GMs, D GMs who were tyrannical or, or whatever. And third edition felt like, particularly because when I started, I was more of a player than a DM. It felt like this is a contract with the group that's that that's to prevent the kind of crazy DM behaviors that we were playing under at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking of it that way. The third edition could protect me from from this bad DMing. That's garbage, rubbish. Yeah. That cannot do that, and yeah. nor should it. And it gave me a sense that like there was uh, support and rule for everything. I just happened to go at memorizing some of them, and so it never became a bother to like look them up. So I liked that about it. And I sometimes refer to third edition for uh, rules or or examples of how things went. Uh, whenever fifth edition doesn't have that. Um, the sheer volume of material, especially when you count Pathfinder, yeah. for for third edition D and D, and the ease with which it can be f converted, is a huge asset. And and you know, I may, maybe I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know already, but there's just a ton of stuff out there for it, and it's really awesome. Oh, um, any, any particular books that you just love, or supplements that you would be like, I, I gotta bring this with me to to my new new school games. Oh my God, Jim! The Book of Nine Swords. God, the Book of Nine Swords was one of the most evocative. I think I I I, I can't say definitively that I read it cover to cover, mm -hmm, but I mm -hmm. read that motherfucker a lot, <laughs> a lot, <laughs> and I I liked it because you know like. Um, Say what was it? Was it second edition or uh, was it advanced? Where um, uh, Oriental Adventures came out? That was first. First, first edition, yeah. Um, but it, it was it, it, it was maligned. It, yeah, there's it, there's, a, there's a lot of there's some people that you know that it was appropriation. It was wasn't handled that, well. Yeah. Certainly for uh, that. Yeah. But to me, the Book of Nine Swords felt like uh, an homage to that same thing. Sure. While yeah. making it its own without. Feeling like appropriation. Sure, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like all those yeah. different styles. Of magical kung fu. It was magical yeah. kung fu, but like in a completely different way, in a fantastical sure. way. Yeah. And it just like I wanted to play a crusader. I wanted to play a <laughs> warlord. I wanted to play. I mean, I did play a crusader. Yeah. And let me tell you, that was stupid. That yeah, pool, I, that yeah. pain, that the damage pool that you like. It's the end of the round. I didn't take that. Yeah, damage. yeah, yeah. Well, I healed up all this that I took early. I ended up playing all three of the the classes that they offered, and, and really liked all of them. And there for a while, uh, after Book of Nine Swords came out, replaced uh, Monk and Fighter and Paladin with uh, Crusader Sword Sage and, and War My or Warblade. Uh, yeah, it was Warblade. Yeah, right Warblade. Now, Warblade. Uh, and, and so, uh, but you know, it also there are a lot of people who credit it for the kind of at will daily and encounter powers that were in Fourth Edition and sort of like interjecting magic into. To the martial classes, uh, mm -hmm. they don't particularly care for that. I think I thought they were really awesome, and and I like taking bits and pieces from Book of Nine Swords. It's also one of the few third edition books I still own, and um, using it uh, for that. Spell Compendium would be another one. Mm -hmm. Spell Compendium, Magic Item Compendium, are all really cool products to like yeah. 
uh, get stuff and, and uh, have a good time. Yeah, meta magic feats. Yes, is another thing from third edition. Yeah. Um, yeah. Feats in general. Feats in general, like the, the I mean, there's the, a lot of them. There's sure. a lot of them, and I understand <laughs> they tried to condense them down and made them a little more powerful. Yeah. Some of them, but like the the item creation feats that were just there. Uh, I mean, just everybody getting meta magic as mm-hmm. opposed to just sorcerers. Or sure. Your one specific spell specialty meta magic feat, maybe for some wizards. Yeah. But yeah, like yeah. you know, the ability to mold and alter your spells. Yes. Like I mean, you know, that was really that was really. It, cool. I mean, like that was the end of third edition, where I finally made that one caster Theron mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. I finally figured out spell casting, <laughs> and I made a freaking superhero. Right. But he had like the perfect three or four meta magics, and he just wrecked shop. I just remember all that the high poweredness of it. The the just sort of the when you if you were playing uh, third edition and you and you were just sort of playing kitchen sink style, it always would end up just like bonkers gonzo. At least mm-hmm. our tables, it felt like it did, and, and so I appreciated that. But it's bloated and, and and not a game that I enjoyed running, uh, to say the least. And you say that now, Jim. Yeah, I mean, I, fourth edition came along and purportedly was going to fix a lot of those things. It didn't, but I feel as though. The big takeaways from fourth. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, first of all, the first one is lore wise. When it came out, I was a little, uh, you know, rubbed my fur the wrong way about how the lore and, and canon of D&D got treated, and especially with relation to those of us who enjoyed it. But at the same time, I liked that they were willing to do something new. And the Dawn War, the elemental chaos, the reordering of the cosmos, the changing of the way elves work, and all that stuff. Like, I, maybe they mishandled it when it came to Forgotten Realms. Maybe it wasn't communicated well enough in the launch campaign. But, like, looking back at it, I think it's awesome. It's something different. I, I am, I'm to the point in my, my relationship with D&D where I'm tired of the Great Wheel. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it. I, I know, I've, I've explored its limits conceptually. And I, yeah. I'm, I like other uh, schematics or schemes yeah. for uh, the cosmos. I guess if I, if, if I had to pick anything from 4th, and it probably came out before, but I do miss, I did play a Deva. And that was a fun race. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know if, if they were there before that, but uh, just the idea of a, like an, an, an eternal race, like sure. something that's beyond an elf. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a different kind of immortal, yeah. where it's more about memory uh, as yeah. opposed to anything else. You know, when it comes to fourth edition, my standing sort of whatever still stands, I will play with someone who knows the system and can deliver a satisfying fourth edition experience. I never had that with fourth, and I don't think I was able to deliver it as a DM myself. It just wasn't my game. Other things worth keeping in there are the healing surges. I love the idea that healing came from something within the target, that it, that it, it sort of like solved that, that the paradox of cure wounds, where it's like at first level it could save your life, and at 10th level it barely matters, yeah. you know, uh, and, and like makes healing something that's a part of the, the person uh, receiving it, which means that it opens up the door for something like Warlord, who is a non-magical martial healer type. Uh, leaders, I think they were calling them mm-hmm. uh, in, <clears throat> in fourth, and there have been people who've updated Warlord, a lot of different uh, hacks for it and everything. I prefer Rob Schwalbs uh, from uh, the Max uh, Press imprint that they've got, but I just like that archetype of, of someone who's a martial uh, fighter, you know, a warrior, but they are more concerned with like the group, more concerned with, with bo- boosting others and making sure that others are effective necessarily than like leading the charge themselves. And I think yeah. it's a, a strong archetype that up until then didn't really have a lot of support uh, although third edition, there were attempts to it. So yeah, they tried. Yeah, they tried, and I, you know, actually, I, I lied. That was not the last thing about fourth. The, the fourth would be monsters. You know, I, the way monsters worked in fourth edition, I do not understand why they went back because they were awesome. <laughs> you know, uh, you can not like minions or, or whatever. You can think elites, bosses, uh, those sorts of templates are, are, are not uh, appropriate. But just the way that they designed the base monsters from a point of view of the DM using them, yeah, uh, it was really satisfying. Uh, and I wish I could take like the the lore of a second edition monster manual with the the way of the monster design of like late era fourth edition, and combine those into a a, a book. But uh, yeah, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons. The Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week, and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, Web DM Plays. Thanks for watching.
tidbits. Yeah. Those are tad bits. Those are tad. Tad bats. Tad bats. <laughs> Jeez. Tad bats. Taddy Mason? Taddy? I did not expect to go nearly a fucking hour. <laughs> Who the fuck is Taddy Mason, Dad? Sorry. <laughs> what were you doing? Tad's gonna pee. And oh. It's 4.30 and we're done, basically. Yeah, that's good, right? So that's, uh, that's fucking amazing. I am wiped out. Oh. Dead 